Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Monday, April 9th, Market Watchers Live show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And to our regulars, welcome back. Well, the market's gotten the week off to a good start. Uh, you can see, actually, let me just make sure I got an update here. We got the Dow Jones Industrial Average right now at 340 points. The S&P 500 up 40. The NASDAQ up 140. Apparently, 40 is the number in case you play Powerball. Uh, the Russell 2000 is up 16 points. Uh, the 10-year Treasury yield currently up uh, almost three basis points, back up over the 280 level. Volatility index continuing to drift a little bit lower, down almost 5% today, just a little over 20. Uh, technology, one of the leading sectors today, up 2.4%, uh, as you can see, but still with that overhead 20-day moving average to try to negotiate. Same goes for the financials, also having a very good day, but that declining 20-day moving average still needs to be negotiated, along with $28 price resistance. You can see the support from back in early March, the failure at that level. Um, at the end of last week. And so anything back up above 28 on the XLF would be bullish. Semiconductors, one of the strongest areas in technology today. But like uh, the other sectors I was just talking about, you can see this industry group still does have overhead moving averages to negotiate. Same goes for the internet stocks, which have been extremely weak uh, over the last month or so. Uh, still a little bit of overhead resistance there at the declining 20 day. Banks having a strong day. We have seen the 10 year treasury yield recently moving a bit higher, and that is helping the banks get a little bit of a bid. Banks up over 2% today. And then finally, biotechs, one of the worst performers over the last month, getting a little bit of reprieve today, up uh, also a little bit more than 2% today. And with that, let me bring in my co host, Aaron. It's good to be back. Aaron, how are you doing? Well, welcome back. We're glad to have you back for sure. So hope you had a very nice vacation in Florida. I did. I had a great vacation. Got to play some golf. Actually, I had my second hole in one of my life. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. Thank you. I uh, was playing with my son. Uh, actually, this was after I got back from Florida. I was playing with my son here in South Carolina. But over the vacation, I did have a 170 yard hole, six iron. I mean, never left the flag, hit the green, rolled right up and it just dropped. And I was like, wow, <laughs> you know, it's kind of, kind of surprised because I haven't really played much golf this year. So, uh, but what's interesting is the last time that I had a hole in one, which was back, I think in either 2005 or 2006, I was coming off of elbow tendonitis. I hadn't played in nine months. Oh my God. First, the first par three I stepped up to. And this, I mean, you're talking about somebody who's played a lot of golf over my life, a lot yeah. of par threes, never had one, was out nine months for, with uh, tendonitis in my elbow, played the first par three, knocked it in the hole. It's like, really? <laughs> but <and laughs> it, What does that say, I wonder? <laughs> I don't know. I guess maybe I shouldn't play uh, nearly as much golf as I do. I'd be better maybe if I played less. Absolutely. But, uh, well, you know, the Ducks made it to the playoffs. So uh, that was the big news while you were gone. Uh, that I have, I know. Uh, for those of you at all interested, though, I did set up a bracket called Stock Charts TV on NHL.com. If you want to do an NHL bracket, I'll be putting the link in uh, the recap, but you can go check that out. Hey, we might have some t uh, some hockey fans out there. Indeed, and hopefully you'll do it too. Yeah, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I mean, I like to get involved. It's not quite the same to me as college basketball or pro football and that sort of thing but a I lot do, slower <laughs> and i get well it's you know seven game series and so it just takes forever it seems like you know college basketball three weeks march madness it's done you know football you get in the playoffs you got a few couple weeks you're in the super bowl uh, i don't know it just seems like the hockey and basketball tend to drag pro basketball tend to drag on for a yeah. while yeah at least the game's really fun so yeah. Well, but course, anyway, if you're at all interested out there, um, Stock Charts TV uh, League on NHL.com for a bracket. Yeah, you know, I did want to say, too, that this was Masters weekend. You know, this is a big, big sports yes. for sure. But uh, the Masters this weekend, I, I get completely engulfed in it. No pun intended. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, I had to have one. Like an engulfing candle. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Uh, but anyway, it was a it was a fun tournament. A lot of excitement. Jordan Spieth trying to win again, coming charging at the end. But anyway, uh, we'll get on to stocks. I'll let you get in the schedule and agenda. Let's get this thing going. All righty. Uh, first of all, tomorrow we have everything stock charts. I know that Bill Shelby will be coming in for that. My dad will be here on Wednesday as our special guest. 
And on Friday, I'll be doing a workshop. I have not decided on what I'm going to do it, uh, what subject. So if you have any that you might be interested in, go ahead and throw those in the survey uh, underneath the um, window there, uh, the, the viewer window. Go ahead and add in the survey, or you can put some stuff in the um, chat room that you might be interested in for me to do a workshop on. As for today, we have Monday setups, and we'll go over what uh, we did last week. I did pretty good. Uh, earnings spotlight, we have John Hopkins back along with Tom. Now we have John, so that'll be great. And then finally, we will, let's see, we have, yes, 10 and 10 to 1. I don't want to skip that. Baidu will be our first one, so you can go take a peek at that. And finally, we will finish up with the decision point report. And with that, Let's go ahead into technical news with Tom. Yeah, and I do want to thank Greg Schnell for subbing for me last week. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Greg. Uh, I know that uh, all of our viewers certainly appreciated having Greg's perspective on the market for a week. Um, you know, we got so many great voices at Stock Chart, so uh, it was certainly awesome to have Greg on here. So Absolutely. I, to, I had a great time with him. Yeah, just wanted to give him a quick shout out. And uh, I know you probably took on some more uh, with the show as well. So I want to thank you, Aaron. Ah, oh, well, I did miss you. That's for sure. <laughs> it was a good week. It was definitely a good week. Actually, I had gone to Florida, so I got some good uh, warm weather. Came back to South Carolina yesterday morning. It was 37 degrees as I went to Starbucks. I was like, really? Is this ever going to end? <laughs> but anyway, let's get into some of this uh, market stuff. Got the 10-year Treasury yield, as I mentioned earlier, up uh, now three basis points, 2.80%. Uh, no economic news out this morning. So the markets, uh, bond market, stock market, just kind of going uh, based on technicals right now. But uh, the 10-year Treasury yield, you can see, had dipped down some. And as a result, we saw you know the banks underperforming. Uh, but we've since seen the banks start to turn back up again with the 10-year Treasury yield, apparently bottoming just above 2.70%. Uh, but a breakout above last week's high around 283, I think, would probably signal another move back up into that 290 to 295 area. And of course, the Fed keeps telling us they're going to raise rates later in 2018. So that is uh, probably the more likely direction that we'll see the 10-year Treasury yield move. I did want to mention uh, one thing that took place last week that I noticed, um, and I'm going to pull up my technical news chart list because I think it's, yeah, here it is. Um, I've gone over this you know, several times in the past, but I think it's good to, to refresh and uh, for those that are new uh, to the show and haven't seen this, I think this is a really important chart. This uh, top part of the chart you can see is the 10-year Treasury yield here in the U.S. minus the German 10-year Treasury yield. So what we're seeing here is that rates have been going up faster in the U.S. than they have in Germany. And what that typically, this goes back, by the way, to 2008 uh, through now. So we're talking about a 10-year chart. Um, and if you take a look at the dollar and how the dollar has performed relative to this, you can see for the most part that as the 10-year Treasury yield here in the U.S. outperforms the Treasury yield in Germany, we see a like move in the dollar to the upside, kind of following suit. Now, at the very bottom here, I have this correlation. And what this does is it compares the difference in yields between U.S. and Germany to the dollar. And for the most part, you can see it is in positive territory. So if you use this correlation indicator, anytime you get readings above zero, it's telling you that the two, um, whatever you're comparing, tends to have a positive correlation. The closer you get up here to one means they're kind of going hand in hand uh, in the same direction. And you can see there has been a lot of time either spent near one or say certainly above one half plus 0 0.5. And uh, But we do have periods and we have had periods where we see what I would call maybe a negative divergence, where we're seeing the U.S. Treasury yields moving higher relative to Germany, but the dollar declines. And we're in one of those periods right now where the dollar's been going down, even though the 10-year Treasury yield has been moving higher here in the U.S. relative to Germany. And each of the prior times, as we've seen the uh, this start to turn back up again, you can see what happens. First of all, the dollar makes a big move to play catch up with what's been going on in the bond markets. And with that, I'm gonna go over to this other chart, which is basically the same chart. It's just uh, added a, an element of the Russell 2000 relative to the S&P. When the dollar goes on the move to the upside, uh, and it kind of makes uh, common sense to me, the Russell 2000 outperforms because as the dollar's going up, 
companies that, you know, multinational companies found on the S&P 500 actually see their earnings decline from foreign currency translations. So when you when you have to translate those currencies back to the U.S. and the U.S. is, is rising, the dollar is rising, that tends to lower or that will lower S&P 500 uh, earnings, those companies' earnings. And so as a result, when the dollar is on a move to the upside, many times we will see the small cap stocks, the Russell 2000, which do all of their business or most of their business domestically. They're not really impacted much by the dollar and their earnings certainly aren't. And as a result, the Russell 2000 tends to outperform. So we're at one of those pivotal points right now where it looks like this correlation starting to turn back up. You can see that the Russell 2000 has begun to outperform here in 2018. And the dollar itself is at a major trend line support and price support level. So all of this together to me suggests the dollar will rise and that would bode very well for small cap stocks in the next quarter. Some of the large cap, I've been noticing like Caterpillar and some of the others, uh, 3M, uh, many of these companies have, they posted great results last quarter. And I was thinking maybe they'd get a run into earnings and we're not really seeing much of a run. And I, w I wonder if some of that has to do with the fact that the dollar has stabilized and maybe the market is anticipating that we're going to get a push to the upside in the dollar. Anyhow, I just wanted to mention that because when you take a look at the UUP, which is the proxy for the dollar, you can see late last week we did make a move up. We challenged the high that was set in early March. We didn't get through it. We've pulled back. But I think if we get this breakout on the UUP, you really want to be careful with some of the S&P 500, some of the multinationals. I think they could still do well. I just think that the money may rotate more towards the small cap stock. Something to think about. Uh, this morning, GM got an upgrade, and I'll go over a couple more upgrades in a bit, but GM uh, did get the upgrade. I wanted to mention this because if we take a look at the autos, we've talked about this before as well, uh, from a seasonality perspective, this is one of the, the more interesting seasonality charts that I have seen. You go back 19 years and take a look at what autos do in the month of April. They've risen 79% of the time over the last two decades in the month of April, much higher than any other month. And look at their average returns in April, 9%. Nothing else on the chart is even close. In fact, if you take the other 11 months and add up the average returns, it's actually more than a 5% decline in the other 11 months. So I don't know what goes on in April with the autos. Um, had some speculation, a couple of emails from, uh, from listeners and viewers and so forth. But I'm not quite sure what it is, but autos do tend to do extremely well in the month of April. And GM gets an up grade. You can see already the performance in GM here early in uh, April has been very strong. Of course, Tesla had a great week last week, as you can see, kicking into April. I don't know what it is, but it seems like uh, seasonality is kicking in for the autos once again. In my blog this morning, I mentioned transportation services. I think this is a really interesting chart. Uh, when you take a look, it's been continually drifting lower here and it's been failing at the declining 20-day moving average. Just did it again recently and you might look at this and say, well, what looks good? Well, the thing, one thing that looks good to me is as we keep setting these new lows, check out the PPO, which is now higher. So we have a positive divergence. And I think if we go into a weekly chart, uh, you'll see that we have come back down into an area where we broke out from. So if you go back into 2017, the highs back in the first half, you can see right around this 260, 265 area. And now we've pulled all the way back down and tested this 265 zone. And so perhaps transportation services could be in for a uh, rally from this point. Uh, Air Lease is one company in this space. And you can see a very similar looking pattern. High back in late January, moving to new lows, lower lows, higher PPO. So AL looks a lot like the overall index. A couple of the better uh, scooter, well, one of the better scooter stocks in this space is XPO Logistics, which has pulled back to a major support level right at about 97 and a half after being up over the 105 level. This would be an area where we could see a rally in XPO, but you can see on a relative basis, this has been a great stock within this space. Uh, one stock in the news today, Novartis uh, agreed to acquire Avexis, A-V-X-S, and this could be helping the biotechs, as I mentioned earlier, they're having a strong day. Uh, Avexis, um, the, the uh, buyout was for $218 in cash. 
Uh, it's only trading at 207, so perhaps the market's discounting a little bit whether or not the deal goes through, but it is a cash deal. So uh, eventually shareholders for AVXS, if the deal goes through, should see 218. This is a huge move, 79%, huge uh, premium paid for the company by Novartis. Um, a order came in today, a big order for uh, Boeing. American Airlines uh, placed an order, signed a major order for 47 of their 787 Dreamliners. And I know Boeing started out the day pretty strong, has kind of given up some of those gains, but it continues to consolidate. It's been a very strong performer. I do like that hollow candle. That should establish major support on Boeing down at about 312 where it opened that day. Uh, I would be looking at Boeing from a range of 312 up to almost 370, which was the high in late February, only five or six uh, weeks ago. So Boeing looks interesting to me. A couple of the upgrades and downgrades. I mentioned GM. Uh, Baidu is an upgrade, but we're going to hit that on the 10 in 10. So I'm going to pass on that one for now. CMA. This is Comerica. Uh, it's had a nice upgrade. The stock is up 2.5% today and has continued to put in higher highs and higher lows. So I like the uptrend here. I think Comerica has got a very good chance to make another run at that 102 level. A uh, couple of the downgrades. Um, WLK was one. I think this is Westlake. Yeah, Westlake Chemical. Downgraded. It did gap down, but has strengthened off of that move to the downside. I would be watching this level around 100 very carefully because volume has picked up as it's moved back below its moving averages. PPO is pointing lower, suggesting that we are seeing an acceleration in this um uh, the uh, selling momentum to the downside. So got some questions here. So far, we're okay because I think this is a key support area and we're holding it. But uh, things have definitely deteriorated a bit in terms of the uh, price volume combination of late. Uh, NLNK is the other downgrade. And you can see this one uh, must have uh, already, maybe it was earnings that came out that sent it down yesterday. Now we're getting analysts uh, kind of jumping on the back of a stock that's already broken and uh, saw a downgrade here. The stock down another 5.6% today on the heels of what was a horrible day last Friday. Uh, did want to mention today that uh, Chart Watchers was out over the weekend. If you go back into the, um, actually, if you turn into the blogs page, if you're not familiar with Chart Watchers, I just want to let you know on the blogs page, on the right-hand side, if you're new to stock charts and you haven't done anything else, go to this page put your email address in and sign up. It is free. You won't be spammed. What you're going to get are some great articles. And so no, that's not where I wanted to go. What uh, let's, let's go into the chart watchers and just go over the headlines. But you can see John Murphy posting about the tariff threat and what the, the impact that that was having um, recently with the market. Uh, John Hopkins will be with us in just a minute talking about earnings reports, how we can make some money there. Of course, I had uh, talked about the reward to risk trades. Uh, a lot of times the market historically does very well leading up into earnings season. Um, and I just provided some numbers here. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out. Greg Schnell talking about the, the volatility and how that's frustrating both sides. And that's part of the reason why I don't like to trade with a high volatility market, because just when you think you're catching it to the downside, you jump back up like we are today. And now all of a sudden things feel much better. You move back up for a couple of days and then all of a sudden there's news out. And anytime you get in a high volatility market and bad news comes out, it is treated a lot differently than what we see in a low VIX market. So uh, that's uh, worth uh, keeping in mind. I thought Arthur's article uh, talking about the percentage of stocks here above the 50 day was very interesting. And then of course, Aaron uh, keeping us up to date on many of the different signals the trend model signals that we get from decision point on a lot of different areas. Anyway, this is all the information you get just in one chart watchers article and they come out twice a month. So again, if you're not a member uh, or if you're not a uh, subscriber to chart watchers newsletter, you definitely need to be one. And one last, uh, I want to go back there one more time to that blog articles page. And again, it's right here on the, the right hand side. I think also on the members dashboard at the bottom. Yeah, you can sign up at the bottom of your members dashboard. Of course, if you're not a member, uh, I don't know if that shows up on this page or not. But anyhow, uh, just a couple of ways to sign up and get some great information with that. I'm going to turn things over to Aaron. Let's get the Monday setup started. All right, let's do that.
Uh, I had four. I don't remember how many you had. I can't remember when you were telling uh, our producer this morning. We'll go over last week's first because you have a great one. I know. I'm kind of excited about that. Let's go over here. So last week I picked uh, Hibbit Sports and I got it at 2380. My target was above 2650. Well, uh, we've reached uh, almost 2750. Uh, we did uh, today's high was 2770. So that turned out to be a pretty good trade. <laughs> I was yeah. feeling good about that. Yeah, that right. might be that might be the best one since we've been doing this on a percentage I, basis. I don't remember one any better than this. I know. I don't either. I think that one was just a uh, well. I know, Etsy turned out pretty good, but that one took a little while to gel. I don't think it did it all in one week. But yeah, this one turned out to be great, and it was just a matter of it came up on my PMO scan. I did have to tweak last week my scans because with the market having you know, been in a negative momentum situation. I didn't have a whole lot to choose from. Today mm -hmm. I'm getting more. So yeah. there was some more, but uh, let's see, a rocket was Greg's pick. You don't have to to sign up for that because um, yeah, that, that one didn't turn out so good uh, for Greg, but you know, it, I could see why he picked it. I thought he had a pretty, pretty darn good argument, but didn't work out. I think the thing just keep in mind with all these picks is that a lot of times, and I know with the one I had two weeks ago was absolutely horrendous. Yeah. Um, but the reason for picking it was that the biotechs at the time were at a major support level. And so I'm anticipating in a bull market that we're going to bounce. And I'm sure Greg was probably looking at key support uh, on Rocket. And I'm sure, again, that 16 and a half area. Uh, if you look at the chart, I mean, I think you can see over the last couple of months, that's an area that's been holding. If it breaks down, uh, certainly if it closes down below that area, which it did, I guess, on Thursday, and I don't want to put words in Greg's mouth, but my guess is that if it starts to break down, uh, he would probably not be uh, continuing to hold it on the way down. Yeah, that's why I've decided when I do mine, I'm I'm picking a stop level just in case. I. <laughs> It, everybody has to trade at their own uh, risk levels and all of that. But, and, and this is done a little bit more for entertainment value, but I know there are people who go out and, and want to go buy what we suggest here. And uh, so I like to put a stop in there just in case. <laughs> so that was last week's, what do I have this week? Uh, so I'm going to go through the four and after thinking about it, I ended up going with JM Smucker as my pick, but we'll get there. Cambrex was one that came up and I did have like 13 and I whittled it down to what we're seeing here about four. So I liked this one in that it had a symmetrical triangle in place. So even though we were really bouncing around in sort of a consolidation zone because it started to turn into more of a symmetrical triangle and the previous trend was rising, then the expectation would be a breakout. And it's just now grabbed that 20-day EMA support. Look there in the uh, thumbnail. You've got uh, the 20-day EMA just missed a negative crossover on the 50. I think that is very positive. So it went back, tested some lows, and is coming back up. So I thought that one looked pretty good. Um, actually, I, need, I think I need my pointer on. I'm going to do that very quickly so people can see what I'm doing. There we go. All right. The next one was Network Appliance. Had a nice breakout from this declining tops trend line. It's holding on to some, you know, longer term support along a, a rising bottoms trend line. I like that the bottoms were rising on the PMO along with the price bottoms. So that's a bullish confirmation. And look at the volume uh, really poked out there on this particular rally. So I like that it's already kind of made the move. So that was really uh, why I didn't pick it for the Monday setup. I mean, I think it's going to go higher, but I think I had better um, upside potential for the one week investment on JM Smucker. So I'll show you why. First, Oriental Financial Group. Uh, this one, I think it's set up nicely. I know the financials uh, we were talking about earlier, I think you did, Tom, that we should see some improvement, especially if the uh, treasury yields move a bit higher. So I thought this one in that space looked pretty good. But again, you know, it's made the run. Overhead resistance is uh, coming. 
I think this tells us to expect the breakout, but we haven't quite had it yet. So this one, I think I would put in the, the watch list area, uh, maybe to get a little bit of a pullback to that 20 and then maybe get in. Uh, so I didn't pick that. This is the one I picked and I think this one looks pretty good. We'll see how it works out for the week. Jam Smucker. And you can see we are just about ready to get a PMO buy signal. Look at the OBV is really nice. The volume pattern, I really like it. We're now in the hot zone for the scooter. We have a double bottom pattern here. And as of now, uh, it has technically executed this double bottom um, while it's trading above 125. That's about where the uh, confirmation line or neckline, however you want to call it is. And you can see the 2050, again, escaped that negative crossover. So I thought that was also positive. So I think the upside potential is pretty good here. I would set my stop probably about 122.50, which is what I put it. So it'd be right along that support area, just to, because I am still feeling a little bit, um, I, I don't want to use the word nervous, um, but I'm feeling kind of neutral to bearish about the market uh, in general. So I, I wanted to tighten that stop and have it a bit tighter. And I think you can, can do that. Upside potential looks great. 132.50, uh, we should see it. Uh, so I think this one looks pretty good. I'm pretty proud of this one. We'll see if it's, I don't know that it'll do quite as well as Hibbit Sports did, but um, I, I think it's lined up pretty good. Yeah, well, Hibbit Sports was a, a great pick, and it was actually in the the uh, specialty retailers, which is a, has been a pretty nice area of the market. Recently, the group got hit a little bit, mostly because of Netflix, um, you know, with its pullback. But uh, the group is starting to pick back up again. I think Hibbit, uh, like I said before, I thought that was a great pick. Um, yeah, SJM uh, is pretty interesting, especially if you're a little nervous about the market because it is in a more defensive area of the market. So if the market goes down, you would think that this is one that would kind of hold up a little bit better. Now, if the market takes off, then, you know, being more defensive stock, we'll see. But Right. Uh, it might not give you the the reward that something in, say, the consumer um, discretionary might. But yes, that, that was the other reason. Thank you for pointing that out, as I feel a lot better about the consumer staples sector right now. So. Yeah. And I think that's a, a valid point. I mean, with all the volatility, I think that's a, for many folks who want to try to, to limit their risk in the market, but they want to still be part of it. I think, you know, trading in a more defensive area makes sense as we consolidate back and forth. All right. I'm going to take a look at some stocks. The, the stock that I'm going to pick this week is going to be in the industrial machinery space. So I'm going to first just show you that chart. Um, so here is the Dow Jones U.S. Industrial Machinery Index. Now, when you look at this coming across, you can see that we're at pretty important support. Um, now, again, I'll go back to two weeks ago. I looked at a chart somewhat similar when I was looking at the biotechs. Biotechs were at a key area of support. It didn't hold. And I know I think the stock I picked was ALNY and that thing fell like 30% in two weeks. So you've got to keep your stops in play in the event that uh, the, the overall group breaks down or if your individual stock breaks down. But here, I do think we've got some pretty solid support. Um, let's pull up the, the weekly chart. I think the weekly chart looked pretty solid here as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the, you can see with the weekly chart, we've come down to the 50-day moving average. We haven't gone below, and you can look back over the last couple of years and see that we've been trading above the 50. And this is actually the first time we've tested the 50-week moving average in a couple of years. So this is a time where I think, you know, if, if the market stays bullish, which, which I'm expecting it to do, uh, getting a 50-day test, or excuse me, 50-week test and getting an area of the market like this that had been such a strong performing group, um, pulling back more than 10% in the last eight, 10 weeks, I think presents some opportunities. So one of the stocks on my strong earnings chart list uh, that I like is MCRN, which is Millicron. So I'm going to go with this one at $19.38. Um, if you take a look, I'm going to annotate it. It is almost sitting on gap support um, right here. So that was gap support. Then the prior high was price support. So this is an area that I certainly would expect to hold. We're all the way back down there. I will say if it breaks and closes below the top of gap support, we could be looking at the bottom of gap support to fill that. Um, but I'm hoping uh, personally, because since I own the stock, 
uh, that this is going to hold right here. Um, I would love to see a long tail below support and to come back up and close above it. I think that tends to be a really strong indication. You can see how that happened back here. The volume really accelerated, and I don't know if that was um, earnings related or not. Looks like timing wise, it could have been. Uh, but anyway, it looked like it was breaking down, reversed back up, held on to the support level, and you can see that led to some pretty strong, uh, to a pretty strong move here. You can see a little bit of a tail that goes down. We actually tested this tail over here, got close to it, and then we re rebounded off of it. So something similar would really get me interested in the stock if we were to break down intraday and come back. But I do like the fact that we were up over 22 and a half. We worked our way all the way back down below 19 and a half. So very similar to the overall index, uh, the industry group. This has been a, uh, a stock that has really uh, struggled for the last six or seven weeks, but I think it could be setting up really nicely. The volume for the most part has, has dwindled during this pullback after it appeared the stock was being accumulated on the acceleration to the upside. So I like MCRN as my pick. I'm gonna give you just a couple of others that I think look really interesting. Uh, the first one is the one I had in my blog this morning, which is Varian Medical. I've had this one before, and I might have even had it twice, but this was the time, this was kind of similar to what we were just looking at on uh, Millicron, where it went all the way back down instead of the top of gap support. This one did go to the bottom of gap support, but you see this tail where it comes back down, looks like it's really breaking down, and then comes back up and holds it, and you can see the the uh, response back to the upside. I think as it's moved back down on fairly light volume, uh, this is one that's got earnings coming up probably in the next two weeks. And I wouldn't be surprised to see a move back to the upside to anticipate the next earnings report. So I think uh, Varian is one that I would be interested in. Uh, I do not own this one at this point. Um, open text I do own, O-T-E-X. Um, it, it, it did come back down. And again, this one also to a gap support level off of earnings. You can see just above $34. Printed some reversing candles, actually made some moves down into the upper 30s and now starting to reverse back up. I think a close back above that 20-day moving average would be very bullish, at least an initial start on OTEX. Skechers, SKX, I think this one is just consolidating sideways. I think continues to look very bullish. I like the move that we saw last week. Volume was just so-so. But I'm, I'm still expecting after sideways consolidation, because it followed an uptrend, I'm looking for ultimately a breakout on SKX above the 42 level. Uh, Twitter. I own Twitter. Twitter worked its way all the way back down to the bottom of gap support, put in that reversing candle. I'll tell you what, internet stocks have been so weak. Twitter, uh, you can say that the stock has been weak, but it's actually relative to the group. But you can see that the internet stocks actually moved to a multi-month low recently. And when you go back and you look at Twitter, Twitter's still hanging well above those prior lows. So if the internet group itself begins to make a move back to the upside as we anticipate next quarter's earnings, I would suspect that Twitter is going to make a move to the upside as well. So anyway, those were the stocks that uh, I wanted to, to go over here. Um, I think they, they present some, some decent opportunities. Uh, but my pick for the week will be MCRN, and Aaron is going with S SJM, and then you can see our setups, uh, the other picks, uh, before we bring in Mr. Hopkins. So here is the here's the summary. All right, so I have it at one twenty five seventy seven, and you have yours at nineteen thirty eight. Got it. So we will see what happens. We got another week. Um, you know, this is going to be kind of an interesting week because the earnings season kicks off on Friday, in my opinion. I mean, usually I think a earnings season kicking off when Alcoa reports. But this Friday, we've got four big banks uh, reporting. J.P. Morgan, uh, Citigroup, PNC, and I think Wells Fargo all report on Friday morning. And I think that's going to be uh, maybe set the tone for what we see coming up in earnings season. So anyhow, with that, let's uh, move over to the uh, earnings spotlight. Um, this earnings spotlight is brought to you by earningsbeats.com. Earningsbeats.com provides high reward to low risk trades. This strategy resulted in a 2017 risk adjusted return 
that outperform the benchmark S&P 500 fivefold. Earningsbeats.com only trades companies that have beaten Wall Street estimates as to quarterly revenues and earnings, and they'll teach you to focus on that combination of strong fundamentals and strong technicals. Learn to exercise the patience and discipline of an experienced trading service. Earningsbeats.com. Better timing, better trades. And Mr. Hopkins, first of all, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am doing really well. Um, Great. Got a, got a lot of golf in. Actually felt some warm temperatures last week down in Florida. So I'm kind of rejuvenated and ready for this earnings season coming up. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you mentioned um, this Friday, you know, the four banks that are yeah. reporting earnings. They seem, you know, I've noticed the last couple of quarters, like you said, Alcoa used to sort of be the company to lead things off. But recently, it's been these three or four big banks mm -hmm. uh, that have reported earnings uh, to get things going. And this is going to be, I don't this is, you know, this has been the, vo the volatility we've experienced, like over the past, you know, three, four weeks, mm -hmm. has really been something. So, I think that the bulls, more than anything else, are so waiting for earnings to start coming out. So some of these things that just keep, I mean, how many days in a row can you talk about tariffs? Yeah, exactly. Right? I mean, you know, it's sort of, okay, fine. We're going to deal with it. You know, people know it's out there. Of course, tomorrow, I think is going to be fascinating because you've got uh, Zuckerberg on the uh, Hill talking in front of, you know, Congress about the issues at Facebook. So that's going to, I think that's going to be a, a sort of a, a telling um, story, but really what it all comes down to is what does the bottom line look like? And so far, you know, we haven't, I'm not aware of like any major earnings warnings. Uh, it's been pretty quiet, which is generally a positive sign. So once, you know, we get into the tail end of this week and the next couple of weeks after that, I think you know people will definitely turn their attention uh, to the bottom line and away from a lot of the static that's just been you know creating havoc out there. Yeah, and I, I mentioned in my Chart Watchers article um, over the weekend uh, that historically, I mean, when you look at the performance of the stock market, the stock market does anticipate earnings season. It likes uh, earnings season because earnings more often than not are better than the prior year. And higher earnings is generally what allows stock prices to rise. Mm -hmm. And I've got a couple of numbers here from my report. The S&P 500 since 1950 has a annualized return of plus 20.03% from March 26th to April 18th. So we got okay. you know about another nine days, I guess, through April 18th. Mm -hmm. But that's more than double what the S&P 500 does throughout the year. So it just tells me that the market does anticipate, we always talk about the market looking ahead, but it's anticipating these better than expected earnings, which mm -hmm. many companies I believe will be delivering. But up on the screen right now, I did, I sent you this article earlier today. I was, I, I happened to run across it and I knew you'd gonna be on the show today. Oh yeah, it's fascinating. I you, yeah, I thought you'd appreciate this. Twice blessed stocks when the yeah. chart fundamentals align. Mm -hmm. And that really is what, you know, you're always talking about at Earnings Beats and what we talked about when we created this, when I was working at Earnings Beats several years ago, um, that it is important to not only look at the fundamentals or not only look at the technicals, but to combine both of them. And a couple of things I just wanted to point out about this article. First of all, I completely agree, by the way, Palo Alto Networks and PVH Corp. I think both look really strong um, technically and mm -hmm. fundamentally. Uh, Anna Darko. Definitely has outperformed energy, but within this, uh, I don't know if you read through this article or not, but I got to point something out because, you know, we do like to try to stress the technicals and we talk about technical patterns a lot here on the show. And I couldn't help when I read and it said energy company, Anadarko Petroleum has a free strong uh, or a strong free cash flow and is technically showing a multi-year <laughs> ascending triangle. Okay. Wow. Now let me, let me pull up APC for you. And I'm going to go to a longer term monthly. This is a monthly 15 year chart. Now I want somebody to point out an ascending triangle to me on this. Aaron, are you listening? Do you see an ascending triangle on this chart anywhere? <laughs> I don't only because it didn't go up and test that, uh, 
top back in 2016, 17. I mean, had we seen uh, it move up and then start to consolidate or move down, I think you could make a case for it, but you only have really those that top and uh, there's no other top. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'm declining tops. I don't know what that yeah. referred to. Um, I mean, I almost can see a little bit here off of this uptrend, maybe. So if we go back to that daily. Well, here's the problem with it, too. Just, you know, if we really want to get into it is there's, uh, as Bolkowski says, you want to draw your pattern so there's not a lot of white space. And if you were to even just sort of, if you wanted to say that top was the top of the triangle, you'd still be getting that rising bottoms trend line from the 2016 low on up with that giant white space underneath. Oh. And uh, yeah, I I don't I mean, want to say double bottom, maybe. I, <laughs> you know, I don't want to pick on anybody because, you know, to me, technical analysis is very uh, subjective. You know, you might see something somebody else doesn't see. And I'm sure many times we put stuff on there and we have, you know, uh, I, I, we've gotten, you know, um, we've gotten responses from people who say, I don't see you know what you're seeing i'm seeing this i'm not seeing so there's some of that that goes on and i don't again i don't want to pick on anybody but i don't see an ascending triangle anywhere on this chart and i think that gives technical analysis a bad name when you start talking about these bullish patterns that i don't even think exist but anyway i thought that was interesting i know john you got a lot to talk about so let's uh let's move on to the earnings season before you give me any individual stocks that you like though yep. what do you of these bank stocks. I mean, you got JP Morgan. Um, looks to me like they're just trying to consolidate a little bit before earnings, but are there anything really you know, stand out to you? Yeah. On no, listen, you know, just in, in, in looking at that, here's a couple of things that are kind of amazing, or at least something that to me is a bit amazing. All we've been hearing about lately is how much, how many times is the Fed's going to raise rates, right? Mm -hmm. Keep hearing it over and over and over. Yet, if you take a look at the ten-year Treasury mm -hmm. bill, take a look at that. You know, TNX. Um, it's it's not telling me that, Tom. If if anything, you know, it's not like it's breaking out. It's gotten it, it's it got near three, uh, a, you know, a while back. But it's having a hard time breaking through that level, and the, you know the market always looks ahead. So yeah. if 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 the Fed is going to raise four times or five times, I cannot get my hands you know head around that. And the other thing is, in looking at the banks, I think the banks would be breaking out big time. You were, just looked at JPM. To me, it's struggling. Now maybe that'll change. You know when they report uh, when they report their numbers. Yeah. Um, but, you know, to me, it's, it's just it's, it's, you know, maybe seeking a new high here and maybe the, they've had a great run. Right. There's no question about it. But I don't know if we're getting closer to peaking on these things or is there another level these things could go to? Yeah, I think they're going to go higher. That's just my opinion. Um, the 10 year Treasury yield, while I agree, the last couple of months, I mean, we've been moving lower, but we had a huge run up. I mean, if you know, we can't ignore the fact that from at the beginning of December, the 10 year treasury yield was 230. And by the yes, end, of January, it was 90. I mean, that was a huge move and it did require, I think, some consolidation. So I still see basically higher highs and higher lows going in here. Maybe we continue to consolidate on the 10 year treasury yield for a bit. Who knows? But uh, I do like the fact that the banks are bouncing back. I'm just going to pull up the bank index. And I know, again, you probably have some individual stocks. Mm -hmm. That the the banks when they broke out back in December, and that's when the ten year Treasury really started to make a move. It broke out from about that four fifty area, and when we went back down recently, we got down to about four fifty. And so I think the ten year Treasury yield is consolidating. I think banks are consolidating, and that's why I want to see how the market reacts to these bank reports on Friday because if they do break down after that, that could spell some trouble. I think I not only yeah. banks, but maybe for the market. Yeah. Hey, I've got a couple of stocks here just to show that even when the market is lousy, that traders still are attracted uh, to companies that are strong and beat earnings. And, um, you know, a lot of people listen to the show know that we have a chart list. And uh, the chart list, we just updated it. We've got about 190 stocks on the list. But here's just a couple of new ones uh, that just reported earnings. One is... Um, 
LW. Let's take a look at LW. Okay. All right, take a look at this stock, okay? The market is volatile. Um, you know, the major indexes way off their highs. And here's a stock that's reaching a new high. And it got there on extremely heavy volume. You know, it, it gapped up mm -hmm. uh, substantially. Um, and it goes to show you, you the, the power of these earnings that if you can, you know, show strong earnings, even when the, even when the market is weak, mm -hmm. uh, you can be rewarded. And we're seeing it in this stock. Yeah, this one's actually a more defensive stock too. I see it's in the um, uh, consumer staples area and mm -hmm. it's performing extremely well. So this is another one I think kind of goes back to what Aaron was talking about with her Monday setups with uh, SJ uh, Smucker, JM Smucker. Yeah, and you mentioned PVH, that made our list. Yep. Right? Yep, that was one that we just looked at on that article. Yeah, and the same thing. You can see the big bar gap up. Yep. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very patient on this one. I'd like to see it. Uh, you know, pull back anywhere near that 20 day would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then one other one is SAIC. Okay, nice move, strong, vol you know, nice volume. I'm gonna wait for that thing to pull back to around 79 or 80. Uh, keep my um, stop tight in case it goes against me. And just a couple of other quick ones. These are actually a couple of trades uh, we closed out last week. One is uh, Chico, CHS. I remember that one. Yeah, we got involved in that stock when it when it uh, you know pulled back. You can see oh, around mid March or so uh, we got involved in the stock and um, put a price target of nine seventy five, and it, it exceeded that level last week. So we took our profits and got out of it. Yep. A very yeah, nice move. This is another perfect example too. We talk about this all the time. When to sell? And I did a workshop on this a few weeks ago. But when you get these breakouts and they don't hold, look at yeah. this. The breakout didn't hold, went right back to support. Here we get the breakout, doesn't hold, and we're backing back off. Now, who knows where we go from here? Yeah. This is an area where, you know, the reward to risk when you're at support, which I'm guessing you got in somewhere around the support area. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you the reward to risk for being long is definitely on your side. But as you get up toward the resistance area, it flips. There's no guarantee you're going through. I mean, again, we just showed that back in late February. So I agree. I, this is the way I trade. I like to trade when I get near resistance level and let everyone else hold and see if yeah. we get. And one last one is, um, matter of fact, this is our chart of the week. Uh, we put it out as an alert to members last week, Square SQ. Yep. And uh, this one has got, you know, 45 is like a big level for the stock. Mm -hmm. This is a case where it, we put it out uh, at 45.15 with a stop of any close below 45. So talk about tight. Yep. And with the price target of 49.50, and um, this is a case where the reward to risk was just too good to turn up, you know, to turn down. And it was coming with the market under fire uh, last week. Sometimes you just got to take the step. But you know, Tom, I want to mention one last thing. You know, we're doing a webinar this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, you'll be in part of it. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, quarterly earnings, you know, the, being strategic. I know you've got uh, maybe a dozen stocks or so that could run into earnings. And I've got some other stocks, you know, that I want to talk about as well. And uh, I went back and I looked at our performance for uh, 2018. Mm -hmm. And uh, where we had, I think about 30, we had 32 stocks out. And that, no question about it, more losers than winners. But I, but even with that in mind, we we're able to beat the S and P by almost four times. And the reason being, the tight stops. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't I can't express enough, especially in this type of environment, where if you're going to get in, because it, this we're talking whipsaw. You're talking whipsaw city. Um, so you've got to make sure you get involved in these stocks when they get close to key support, either technical or price support. They go against you, you get out. Uh, if they get anywhere near your profit uh, target, you get out as well. That's the only way you can you know, possibly trade this market right now. Yeah. Um, you know, whenever I get that question on holding stock, you know, whether you should sell them based on a closing stop or an intraday stop, for me, a lot of times it, it's based on the market. When we're in a high volatility market like this, I think it's really important. You're going to get whipsawed. 
some from time to time. There's no doubt about it. But I think you have to have intraday stops because we've seen over the past couple of months how the market, when it starts to lose support, it starts lo- the Dow starts dropping 100 points at a time. And, you know, you don't see that in a low volatility environment. The Dow, when it sells off, sells off like 20 points and then it's ready to go higher again. But in a high VIX environment, when we start seeing the selling, we've seen these huge. And let me just pull up the S&P 500 and just remind everybody over the last two months, look at these big red candles. Notice when the VIX is low, when we do sell off, you hardly see any selling. Mm -hmm. But a high volatility environment, that's where you get into these big red candles. And if you're holding until the close, Sometimes the last two hours of the day, you can see significant damage to your portfolio. So I'm not a fan of intraday stops, but I think if you're going to trade in a high volatile environment, you almost have to have. Yeah. And we'll be talking about that in the webinar today as well. Anyways, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. But I want to mention if you go to our website at Earnings Beats and uh, look and go to the About Us uh, section, you'll see at the top top, there's a free trial offer and um, that gets you in the webinar. There's no, there's no charge for the webinar, and as a bonus, we're going to provide our chart list to members so they can then take these 189 stocks. If you're a stock charts member, and you can you can apply your own criteria, you know whatever you are looking for as a trader. We're doing the work for you uh, because it's a lot of work to find these stocks. Uh, you might as well take advantage of them uh, in this kind of market because remember. When times get tough, people are looking for the best of the best. Yep, I agree. Okay. All right. It was great having you on, my friend, and we'll see you again in a couple weeks. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, John. And there he goes, John Hopkins from Earnings Beats. Uh, Yeah, I tell you, I don't know, Aaron, you know, I know you're more of a longer-term trader, but the whipsaw action that we see in this high-volatility market, you know, the, the big moves intraday, I know I went on vacation. I thought, okay, we started vacation last week. Thought maybe we got in the bottom and we we're ready to make a move up. And then last week, I mean, it was, as John mentioned, every time you know there's a mention of a potential trade conflict, the market just sold off. I mean, it was just, you know, we'll ask questions later. We're just going to sell now. And yeah, it's very just difficult. Uh, very rocky, which is why I've been mostly on the sidelines. So I'm still waiting to see how this uh, comes together. But I'll talk more about that in the decision point report at the end of the show but right now guess what it's time for the 10 and 10 okay uh let me go ahead and get those up here for everyone to see we had almost 40 requests today so yeah uh we're looking at a lot (laughs) to come in here so don't be uh, too upset if yours doesn't get uh picked um but uh let's see we'll look at the rrg just briefly here so we can see at least where they where they're standing on the list and we have quite a few. That looks like my first grade uh, coloring assignment. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd really have to take some of these tails away to make it even uh, readable, readable. All right, here we go. So these were the areas uh, that we that everybody requested. Actually, quite a few in that uh, leading category right now. So that'll be interesting. I will. Uh, you still have a few moments to put your votes in for the most popular uh, requests. So just like the ones in the chat room and I'll be pulling that up as our second symbol, but our first one is gonna be Baidu. All right, let's take a look here. And Baidu, what I did is I set it up on my relative chart and uh, I'll go ahead and go to the bottom first and just let everybody know how you can set this, this chart up. So I've got uh, the industry group, I've got, uh, and these are all under the indicators, the price indicator. So I've got dollar industry, then I've got dollar symbol colon dollar industry. So this is going to, no matter what stock you put in, it'll give you that symbol relative to the industry group that it's in. And then I've got dollar symbol colon dollar SPX. So it tells you how that stock is doing relative to the S&P 500. And then finally, dollar industry colon dollar SPX. So that tells you the, the group that it's in, the industry group relative to the S&P, how the group is doing. And so it's just one snapshot that I kind of like. It just gives me a lot of information on one chart. And here with Baidu, uh, I went ahead and annotated this. And you can see there's really important gap support. And this is another example of a false breakdown and a recovery. And look at what happened afterwards. Really important to follow these candlesticks. 
But just recently, Baidu did move back down close to this 210 level. I think that's your key support. Resistance up near 270. So anything down in the lower portion of this chart, I think gives you a good solid reward to risk. Now, obviously, the closer we get to 210, the better that reward to risk looks. Uh, but here, Internet stocks, this is what I was talking about earlier. Internet stocks have really been under pressure. And that, of course, is not helping Baidu. It's not helping a lot of stocks in that space. We've seen Facebook really getting hit. Uh, Twitter, even after a great earnings report, has been coming down. Snap, all these companies that uh, you know had been performing quite well have struggled of late. But it does seem to like the group is consolidating and starting to make a move back up. Here's Baidu relative to the internets. I would not say it's been one of the better ones, but this is a key area of relative resistance that we want to keep an eye on. Baidu has holding its recent low in terms of relative support versus the S&P 500. And then finally, internets. And this is what I was talking about. Internets relative to the S&P 500 were fine until about three or four weeks ago. And we have we saw a quick drop down. But in the past, when we've seen these, these uh, big moves to the downside, they've been followed with relative strength. And so it looks like the group is starting to strengthen against the S&P 500. So if you can find stocks within the group that are near support, I think they set up pretty positively. So personally for me, I would be a buyer of Baidu. All right. Wow. Okay. Uh, we will use that relative chart. So that will be in the um, Market Watchers live list because a lot of people ask how to set that up. So if you go to the Market Watchers live chart list later today, this chart will be in there and you can select it and get all of those settings. All right. Well, we better pick this up here. Okay. The most popular request was Micron, MU. All right. MU, um, I think probably... Well, 50, I thought, was a really big support level, and we didn't hold it. Uh, we did go a little bit below it. I think moving back above that level will be key. I think if we fail at 50 and move to a new low, I think 46 is going to be your next level. I like Micron. I like the semis. We're starting to turn back up on them. But I would be careful, especially if we lost $46. All right. Next one that we will do is, let's see, COP, ConocoPhillips. Yeah, um, not in a great space, but performing very well. It is, uh, it's got decent volume today, as you can see, and it is up against significant price resistance. That was the intraday high that we could see from back in January. Uh, from a closing perspective or from a candle body perspective, we have yet to see a close or an open above about 60 and a half. We're trying to do that today. PPO looks good, higher highs, higher lows. I mean, I'm not a big fan of energy and in this space, but I gotta say, COP is one of the better ones. Breakout above 61 would be bullish. All right. Let's do, uh, what haven't we done in a while? Let's do global timber and forestry. Wood. Yeah, you got to like that ticker symbol. I, of course, do. For those of you who don't know, that's my other last name. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I like the breakout here. Uh, we got some gap support and price support, both at about 79 uh, the only thing that I would be careful about, in my opinion, is the volume. I mean, you can see today only 15,000 shares, and rarely does it go above 100,000 shares. So it's not something I would trade because I do like to see a little bit more um, liquidity. The problem with these stocks that don't trade much is many market makers do not make a market in these stocks. So you're going to probably get some of these smaller, obscure market makers that control much of the trading. And that's why I think that the it, it can be very volatile. And again, it's just a higher risk. And I try to minimize my risk. So that's why I don't trade it. But technically, uh, 79 is your gap in price support. And then the rising 20-day moving average at 78 should also offer up some nice support. All righty. Let's see the next one. Let's do, how about uh, material space, Alcoa, AA. And they should be coming up with their earnings pretty soon. But nice breakout today, uh, for sure. It's been holding the 44 level and had been consolidating in a range between this 44 area and let's just call it right at about 49, 49 and a half. And we gapped up. Look at the volume coming in today. Gapped up and trading above it. PPO just turning positive. I think there's some good things here on Alcoa. I think as long as it holds on to the bottom of gap support down around 48, I would be okay with it going forward. 
All righty, let's see, for our Canadian friends, why don't we try uh, Toronto Dominion Bank, td.to. A lot of interest in the banks. Yeah, and for good reason. Uh, the banks definitely are going to be in focus this week. Uh, Toronto Dominion hasn't performed as well. Most of the banks have, that we looked at earlier, you know, have been down but are consolidating. This one continues to fall, but I do think you're going to find some really good support down at about the 68 and a half to 69 area. And that is where we had that intraday low from early February. This is when the market was really fearful. You can see that hollow candle on very heavy volume. That tends to mark pretty significant support. And that's where it opened. So the closer TD gets down into the, the 69s, um, I, the better I like it from a reward to risk. I do not believe we're going to lose these lows from early February. All right. Let's see. Let's do uh, Bluebird. Blue. Yeah, this is one of the bios, and I think this is in gene therapy. And that uh, the announcement today with that earlier company that I talked about where Novartis bought it is helping a lot of the stocks in this space. But Blue, like so many other biotechs, really fell apart. And I was surprised. I was not looking for this kind of uh, movement to the downside in the biotechs. I don't think they're completely broken, but I need to see more strength before I would be willing to commit. First thing they're going to have to do is get back up above that declining 20-day moving average. You can see Blue lost it with increasing volume. So if I was annotating here, first thing I would be looking for would be a breakout above that declining 20-day moving average. I do like that reversing candle. That is a nice bullish engulfing candle on just so-so volume. Uh, I think we can get to the 20, but I don't know if we're going to get through on this first test. All right. Let's see. Next one, uh, JCPenney, JCP. All right, haven't looked at this one in a while, but it was performing well. Yep, it's starting to turn back up again. Uh, I would say at this point, uh, and by the way, there's that black candle off of an uptrend on heavy volume. That's normally a reversing candle. If that one didn't convince you, the bearish engulfing candle here should have. Uh, so it did go into a little bit of a tailspin for a while. It's been holding on to a key area of gap support, which was all the way back in uh, November. You can see the heavy volume gap up here and these pullbacks have been holding the 275 area. I think that is a critical level going forward. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see JCP continue to move back toward the recent high up uh, around 435 ish or so. I know that's a very wide trading range. JCPenney was under significant selling pressure for a long time. I think there are probably others in the space that are better in terms of risk, uh, but this one, got a lot of reward, potential reward, if it does continue to move higher. One thing maybe to look at, if it is starting to strengthen, that rising 20-day moving average it held on Friday, I would look for it to continue to hold. All righty. Let's see, next one, uh, PSCH. Uh, where was that? Uh, yeah, PowerShares Healthcare Portfolio. So healthcare. Okay. Um, well, I think overall the market, in my opinion, wants to go higher. I think we've got a nice uptrend in play here. Uh, I mentioned in my, I think it was in my article, the Chart Watchers article, but if not, one of my blog articles last week, that one of the ways to play the stock market when you're more nervous is to look more at ETFs as opposed to trading individual stocks, because you're not going to get the same amount of volatility with an ETF. And believe me, with the VIX as high as it is, you get plenty of volatility even with the ETFs. But uh, it is one way maybe just to, to play it a little safer. Uh, with the market being so volatile, but I'd watch this trend line. I think as long as the trend line holds, I'm fine with the stock or the ETF. All righty. And the last one is Home Depot. All right. Uh, Home Depot. I, I think I saw earlier today that home improvement stocks were the only uh, industry group within consumer discretionary that was down today. I don't know if that's still the case, but Home Depot has moved into positive territory. I do like the PPO starting to turn up with the prices continuing to move lower. So for me, again, that's what I would annotate here. Uh, you can look at the closes and it should be based on close. Some of these are hollow candles. So you got to be careful that you're getting the actual closing lows because PPOs, MACDs are based on closing prices, not on intraday moves. But I think there you can see that we are starting to turn here on the PPO back to the upside, even though prices have been going down. I think we're getting close to a bottom here on a Home Depot. I would not be surprised to see a run back up to the 182 level, 182 and a half, 
And if we clear that, I think Home Depot could uh, head more for a run. This is another stock, by the way, that just seems to me like maybe the rising or the potential for a rising dollar may be holding the stock back because earnings could be negatively impacted by a higher dollar. All right. And that concludes the 10 in 10 to 1. And you should be able to see all those symbols right now. I will have those up after the show in our Market Watchers Live chart list. And you can find that chart list by going to the Market Watchers Live blog. And in there at the top of the page is the chart list. If you click in any article, there are helpful links at the bottom of those articles for my PMO scan, for the Stock Charts YouTube channel, among others. So go ahead and check out that Market Watchers Live blog, and you'll find that chart list with these symbols at the top of the Market Watchers Live home blog page. And with that, I think it's time to talk a little chart con with everybody. Shall we? Yep, it'll come a lot faster than it seems. I mean, it's, I, I remember this a couple of years ago um, where we were sitting in March, April, and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, ChartCon was upon us. We know how fast the summers can go. Um, I can't wait. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's not awesome. getting here soon enough. <laughs> yep, and you can just talk, you know, just look back at this show and probably last week, you know, with you and Greg, how many times we've talked about risk. Indeed. Uh, Everybody wants to make money. Everybody talks about returns, but really you need to be thinking more about risk because it's also the downside. You want to protect your portfolio and ChartCon, that's the theme of the entire conference is that everyone's going to be giving you their take on how you can address risk, managing risk. Indeed. And right now there's still early bird pricing. It is an online conference event. You will get, uh, if you've been watching Stock Charts TV, you've probably gotten a taste of it from our previous chart con back in 2016. And uh, we won't be replaying the 2018 uh, videos, at least not for another year and a half, if possible, we might. I don't know if we even will. So don't think that you're just going to get it on Stock Charts TV. Uh, chart con 2018 uh, will not be on Stock Charts Stock Charts TV. Uh, the event price right now is early bird priced, $199. Highly recommend you go check it out. Stockcharts.com slash chartcon. That will get you there. And now I want to go into our quickly a market update for you. All righty, let's make sure this is all up to date. Here we go. All right, so uh, just taking a quick peek at what's going in the, on in the markets. These are two-day charts. As you can see, Dow having a great day. Pretty much all of the large cap indexes, uh, S&P and the Dow are both looking at uh, making new intraday highs. Looks like the NASDAQ and small caps are pulling back somewhat, um, but right now this latest candlestick is showing a little bit of a breakout from a declining trend. We can see that uh, Toronto TSX is also doing quite well. Treasury yields are up. Uh, pulled back just a little bit, but currently reading at 2.801%. Uh, we have UUP gap down consolidating sideways, and we can see that commodities are moving up, nice gap up, uh, probably affected by uh, oil prices, which also gapped up. Uh, they've hit in intraday high and are consolidating now uh, after going down just a little bit. Currently, USO is reading at 1278 Gold was really choppy trading earlier today, but it's now broken out in a big way. Uh, but it is pulling back just slightly off of that giant candlestick, currently reading 126.65. The volatility index is dropping just a bit today. We're now getting readings right around 20.5 on the VIX and TLT. Gap down and is forming a interesting rounded bottom here, but that gap uh, could be posing some resistance problems and we might see bonds moving down again uh, to finish the day. And with that, I'm going to complete our market update because I have lots to talk about for the decision point report and I just want to get right into that as soon as I can. So I'm not going to give you the, the voice right now, Tom. Sorry. <laughs> I need to get right into it or I'm not going to get it done. All right. Let's see. And I'll go to my chart list. Uh, I'm going to show you my decision point live chart list uh, that I 
update pretty much every day and you can get to it it's the decision point live chart list so like market watchers live you go to the decision point blog and the link for the decision point live chart list is right there so you can go and look at all these charts that i'm showing you and you can click on them and save them and annotate them the way you want uh, lots of possibilities there but i'm going to go ahead and we're going to start with the s p and what's going on with that and uh, I've, if you've been reading my what I've been watching, I, I am, uh, I, I don't want to use the word nervous. I, I'm not convinced that we're ready to just take off on a, another nice uh, rally run just yet. I think we still have either at least some consolidation, probably have to work through, um, possibly another drop. But we did hold support here along that rising bottoms trend line. And you can see that although we dip below that 200 day EMA, we did hold that support level on that rising bottom support trend line. Uh, you can also see the low back in Febu February, we didn't go down and actually test it completely, but we have managed to come back out of that. The PMO is trying very hard to turn back up. It is actually rising at this point in time. Uh, but I would certainly like to see a little bit more than just sideways um, confusion added here. I like when I look here, and I'm going to annotate it right now because I'm surprised I didn't already. A uh, really nice breakout along. Um, that's really big. There we go. Uh, breakout on that OBV. Uh, really like to see that. And so I think that gives us some um, some good vibes here. Uh, you can also see that we are now trading above just barely uh, what was the, the uh, confirmation line for that double top. And so I think that is good news. It looks like this, uh, although we probably needed to go down to that February low or a little bit further down uh, to get to the actual minimum downside target of this pattern, but I think we came pretty close. Uh, so I think the pattern has executed, and now we do want to see price break out above what was that confirmation neckline and get above the 20-day EMA. We're not seeing it just yet, and, and that's why I'm still feeling more neutral about the market right now. And in fact, the decision point timing models have us on a neutral signal currently for the intermediate term trend model. In fact, I'm going to take you very quickly to the member dashboard, you can get to all of the decision point signals here and have them all set up on your dashboard however you would like. But I did want to point out, you can see that in all four of the scoreboards that I cover, the long term is the only thing still listing as bullish and on a buy signal. And I'm just going to run through these quickly because they look pretty much the same. And there's your NASDAQ, same. Uh, I have the dates that those changed and you'll note that it took a lot longer for the NASDAQ 100 to pull those uh, bearish signals out, but they did arrive and they haven't come back out. All right, so let's get back to where we were. I wanna look at our, our signals currently, uh, the condition. Let's look at the stock market condition based on the decision point indicators. So these are the climactic indicators. These are the ones, um, you know, I track the VIX uh, on an inverted scale because I'm looking for climactic readings, climaxes, these uh, readings that are spiked out, you know, larger than what we've seen, because that's where you get the information. And if you combine that with a VIX that is, you know, moving below or above the Bollinger Band, you usually are going to pull um, the next day or two what's going to happen. And so the only issue I've had is we've had these very climactic readings here. And you can see uh, last Friday's, the net advance declines were quite deep here on both uh, volume and just the net advances declines. And that comes after these declining um, readings already that we'd had on um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. It didn't combine though with a drop uh, below. It didn't test anything as far as the VIX. As you can see, we're still sitting pretty much right in the middle as far as the VIX goes. Uh, so I'm not looking really for a breakout of this consolidation zone just yet, but I think when you get readings this high 
uh, on the net advances declines on breadth, when we see those readings, typically you're going to see a reversal. So I'm looking at these readings as being uh, indicative of a selling exhaustion. So I think the, the serious downside uh, is is probably over with at this point over the next two days or three days anyway into this week. I would expect to see prices uh, consolidate or maybe move up just a little bit at this point, but we're in a pretty decent consolidation zone. And I think that actually is positive for the market that it didn't, that it was able to stop on that 200 day EMA pretty much and now is just consolidating sideways. So, you know, this is the setup I would like to see in preparation for a new rally move. But like I said, there are still some problems out there that are bothering me. Here's one of them. As far as our short term indicators, and I'm going to actually take this down just a little bit more. Let's try eight months. Just so it's stretched a little bit more for you. There we go. So what we're looking for, of course, again, are these uh, readings overbought, oversold. We want to see reversals and what happens after those. So as you can see, we had very deep oversold readings that we got back in February after the big decline, not a surprise. And then we started shooting back up uh, on these indicators and they were giving us that information early. We had already seen that uh, it turned out to be a little bit of a false bottom there on these indicators, but it did give us an awareness that something might be uh, shaking out here. And we did get the rally off of that. It's these tops that bother me quite a bit. Um, that tells me that there could be some issues, especially when we're turning down like we are now. That that suggests to me um, downside. And, you know, again, I'm still looking mostly for consolidation, but you can see there's still room for it to go down uh, as far as um, the S&P is concerned, down to that 2580 level. Uh, and likely that would bring these indicators back down into oversold territory. So for now, I'm not seeing a big rally setting up in the short term when I look at uh, the short term indicators. I know that sounds a little counter to what we were looking at over here on the climactic indicators, but remember this is for a day or two and the selling is exhaustion doesn't necessarily mean a buying initiation. A selling exhaustion means we're done with some of that downside, um, but I would look in this ter in terms of after seeing those short term indicators, I would certainly look at those as uh, consolidation uh, as the likely reading. I think short term indicators do uh, give us a little bit of warning. We might see a test a little bit lower. So that's a bit concerning to me in the short term. However, comma, as they say, the intermediate term indicators are starting to look up. Um, I, I'm liking the fact that we got positive crossovers, at least we we did on Friday. We'll have to see if these hold up, but with a, a positive day right now, looking at a one and three quarter percent rise, on the S&P 500, I would expect to see these continue higher. This is good for the intermediate term. This tells me that maybe after this consolidation that we're experiencing right now, we could come up uh, and start breaking out. But at this point, um, I think there's still some more shaking out we have to do here. But it's nice to see those intermediate term indicators looking pretty good. Let's move on to the big four. And here we have UUP. I've been looking at a possible bull flag setting up here on UUP. I have been waiting. Greg and I talked about this last week, Tom. We have been waiting so long for the dollar to break out. I mean, I have been waiting since mid-February and I keep counting on it. We end up going down and testing lows and then fake out, break out. Coming back down, I think the good news is, you know, at 2340, we managed to, to make some support. Of course, we dipped down below that before, but that gave us this possible flag formation lining up on UUP, but we're not getting the breakout from, and it's just really frustrating. And now I'm looking at a PMO that is trying to top. Uh, none of that is really good news. I just can't, uh, I can't understand really. We've got these rising uh, tops or just a rising PMO like this. And we're seeing these tops are almost flat. Uh, that's a positive divergence. You know, we should be seeing a breakout here in the dollar. So, you know, we'll we'll keep a lookout. But for now, it's just neutral sideways. It, but it's prime for a breakout. I'm still looking for that breakout in the dollar this week. 
I think uh, I would just say too with the dollar, the market I think also is anticipating it. I was referring to that earlier with the mm -hmm. small caps outperforming the large caps for the past uh, week or two. Um, it's just been forever, Tom. I, I can't even, I mean, this was the perfect setup. That double bottom was the perfect setup. And then we closed, we gapped up and then we closed it over here and it was just looking so good. We broke out. I was thinking, yep, here we go. Nope, did not happen. Nope. Nope. So let's go on over to gold. Let's see here, try that again. All right couple more minutes here. Okay, so what we're looking at with gold, it's been in this giant trading range for some time. I just don't see it breaking out of that. I was very uh, surprised that with the shakiness of the market, we really didn't get uh, the kind of move out of gold that I would have liked to have seen. Uh, the, the PMO, we still have rising tops here, and that coincides with some declining bottoms right about here. And so I think that is, well, it is a positive divergence. So I should expect for gold to start heading back up. But, you know, when I look at the chart, um, I think this is good. We're starting to see some deep discounts uh, on the physical gold trust. That tells us uh, there's a lot of, um, there's uh, bears out there. It's bearish. So, you know, we're getting bearish enough uh, sentiment being contrarian. That means you should look for a rise. So remember bearish sentiment, bullish for whatever the index or item that it is you're looking at in this case gold. It's sitting really in the middle of this trading channel. You know, I like that positive divergence on the PMO. So I am expecting a move up to that 1360 level. Let's see here, USO oil, another one that's been sort of co confounding to me. Uh, I should move that little circle over. We've got a PMO sell signal here. The good news is your scooter is very high. So on an intermediate to long-term basis, oil still looks pretty good. It's holding this rising bottom support line. Um, I guess uh, CNBC might call this an ascending triangle, <laughs> which I think you could make a case for. But again, Volkowski says, try not to dry, draw those um, formations with a lot of white space in there. Uh, I think instead of an ascending triangle, we ended up with uh, sort of a, a complex double bottom here, a little bit of a rising double bottom. But the main thing is, is we're holding that support along that rising bottoms trend line. I'm expecting it to go up to test that 1325 area. Yes, we've got a PMO sell signal, uh, but I, I suspect given that we've held on to that rising bottoms line, I'm still expecting a 1320 move to 1325. Uh, but keep an eye on that 20 day EMA. The fact we do have that PMO sell signal does leave USO vulnerable for a pullback here that could take us down to that 1250 area. So pay attention. And now we've got uh, DL TLT to finish it off. And here we go. Nice rising trend channel that I've been watching. And in fact, we did get a breakout to the upside, which was a little bit of a an issue that told me to kind of expect a pullback because that gave it sort of a parabolic look to it. And we got that move back down. Look at the 20 and 50, just about ready for an intermediate term trend model buy signal as far as the decision point timing models go. You know, we saw some deceleration on the PMO, but it is starting to rise again. Uh, we're getting a top uh, above a previous top. It hasn't actually topped out here, but we know when it finally does, it will be rising. And we're seeing declining tops in price, and that's a positive divergence. So I'm actually expecting uh, TLT to continue to do well. It may need to come down here, though, and test that 50-day EMA, even possibly this the bottom of this rising trend channel. Uh, based on the PMO, though, I'm, I'm thinking that we're we're going to continue higher. I don't think we're going to need to test the bottom of that rising trend channel, especially when you've got that 20, 50 day EMA intermediate term trend model buy signal uh, in the batter's box there ready. And the only other thing I didn't show, and I, I even made a note to show it, so I'm going to show it really quick, is the Wall Street sentiment survey. 
Everybody took that uh, last week on Friday. Uh, I thought it was very interesting as far as the audience poll goes. We had, I think it was over 850 responses or something like that. And 41% were saying the market would close higher this week. 38 said lower and 21 were neutral. Well, look at what the market timer said. Uh, we saw a 55 reading here for bulls and a 30% reading for the bears. And uh, I was, uh, I think I was in the bearish camp. I think I came in uh, saying would close lower this week. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a when you've got the S&P up one and three quarters percent, I'm not so sure I'm going to be on the right side of this one. But we're seeing very bullish readings going into this week. And honestly, that's short term bearish with um, sentiment being contrarian. However, this is a very short term survey of one week and the market timers um, tend to get it right more often than not. So um, at this point, they're feeling pretty bullish. And with that, I am going to conclude it. I know we're running a poll right now. Uh, will Facebook hold price support at 150? And um, right now, everybody's saying no, 35% of you. All right, to conclude though with the decision point report, stock market conditions uh, were split. I think the, that we're still looking at neutral readings as far as Wall Street sentiment survey is concerned. Climactic indicators tell me I'm looking at a possible selling exhaustion. As I said, that doesn't equal a buying initiation. I think that just tells me that we've kind of exhausted a lot of the downside movement, but we might need to do some more shakeout sideways. Short-term indicators are very bearish and overbought. Uh, so that tells me, again, we're in this consolidation area. Intermediate-term indicators looking pretty good. Stock market trend, uh, really I'm bullish in the long-term, short-term, intermediate-term neutral. And then finally, the big four. Uh, I won't read it to you. I will have this in the Market Watchers Live uh, recap so that you can go and, and look at this more closely. And again, Decision Point Live chart list is where all those charts are that I just showed you. So, Tom, time to close it up. Yes, I will say that uh, just, you know, you don't have to go back and show the chart, but that USO chart, to me, that is a much more of a, an ascending triangle than the one that I pointed out earlier. Yes. Uh, uh, on that uh, energy stock APC. I mean, I couldn't see one at all there, but I definitely could see one uh, possibly forming. Uh, yeah. The one that you showed. Exactly. Uh, so what's coming up this week? Tomorrow we have everything stock charts. Bill Shelby will be in to show us some tips and tricks. My dad, Carl Swenlin, will be in on Wednesday to talk intermediate term. And then on, on Friday, I'm going to be doing my workshop. Right now, I'm leaning on doing my workshop on recognizing divergences, negative and uh, otherwise, as well as convergences, bullish confirmations, etc. So I think that's where I'm leaning. I'll come up with a nice uh, name for it later this week. Awesome. Well, just a couple things uh, to point out. First of all, I know you said that you might uh, not have the direction of the S and P correct this week, but it is only Monday, and we exactly. had no. We know how volatile this market's been, <laughs> so you literally could wake up and be back in the driver's seat again tomorrow morning. I mean, we we really don't know. Yeah, like I said, probably more shakeout sideways movement. Yeah, and then uh, Facebook. I agree with the crowd. I, I I don't know. I think Facebook still got some issues. Big breakdown with a negative divergence on the weekly chart. Uh, it's got a lot to show still um, before I would be uh, back on board with Facebook. I think there are better alternatives out there. Mm, I agree. And with that, uh, I do want to thank everybody for being with us today. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit. It's actually just beneath the chat room. Uh, you get There's a link there. How do we do? Just click on that very brief survey. We'd love to get your feedback and hear what you think of Market Watchers Live. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Monday afternoon, everybody, and hopefully we'll see you back here on Tuesday. Happy trading.